Welcome to the Picture This Photography Podcast, where we talk about all things photography. And this week, we're talking about five free ways to improve your photography. You don't need fancy gear. You don't need to buy anything. You don't have to worry about techniques or anything like that. But I guarantee that you will learn something. And I think people are especially going to be impressed with my one eye trick. Let's tell them about our sponsor, Squarespace. Yes, Squarespace. Whether you need a domain, website, or online store, you can make it happen with Squarespace. I know, I have one, and it's super easy. And you can get a 14-day free trial. You can go to squarespace.com, and when you're ready to get your Squarespace portfolio, you can go to squarespace.com slash Chelsea and use the coupon code Chelsea to get 10% off. Thanks, Squarespace. Number five tip. Let's get right into it. Learn to edit. And I wanted to bring this one up because I think editing can be very challenging and sometimes people resist it or they tell themselves that it's cheating and it's definitely not. It's always been a part of photography. Uh, Photographers have spent countless hours and days and weeks in the darkroom making their pictures perfect. And it's a great way to add your own style to your photos and to make your photography style your own. And another thing, Tony, it's a great way to learn. It's not just about photo manipulation and trickery. It's about seeing what your final photo was like, the things that you wanted to take out, like flyaways. You'll spend a few hours editing a couple of those and you're going to improve your photography because then next time, you're just gonna brush your model's hair, or you're going to avoid those power lines, or you're gonna make sure the background of your photo doesn't have some rogue person in it that you have to get out later. I've learned so much about photography just from learning to edit. Yeah, if you're fundamentally against editing, okay. But edit your photos and then don't share the edited version because that process of editing teaches you so much about what you needed, what you did wrong. Ansel Adams was a huge fan of post-processing in the darkroom, and you could see how it changed his photography. He started going back, instead of trying to dodge and burn the light to be different, he would just go back when the light actually was different and to get it right in camera. It doesn't require you to invest in like Photoshop or Lightroom or spend hundreds of hours. We do have video books that cover Photoshop and Lightroom that you can check out at Northrop.photo, but there are lots of free apps. Like your smartphone has great editing capabilities built right into it. I use Visco. That's one of my favorites. And since my final format is sometimes just on people's phones, I'll edit my photo on my computer, then I bring it onto my phone, and I'll edit in Visco or even edit on Instagram before I do my final post. And it always looks better. Yeah, I really like Snapseed. And even just the built-in editor on the iPhone is really powerful. And enough to take your photo from like a 6 to an 8. I also think that if you're a working photographer, having your own style is something that's going to attract your clients. It makes you stand out from any other photographers in your area. So you should make your own presets in Lightroom if that's where you edit. Or, you know, if you're really super cool, you could buy my presets in our store at Northrop.photo. <laughs> but some people don't have that that flair for style, Tony. I could eject that for free. Okay, let's go to number four. Plan your photos. This one is so powerful. People have this misconception that they just need to show up at a place. And if you're a good photographer, if you're a talented photographer, you'll make an amazing photo no matter where you are. We showed up at Yosemite and it was midday and there was tons of traffic and we didn't have a good plan. And do you think I got an amazing photo? No. I didn't. And if Ansel Adams had showed up at that same time and day, he wouldn't have gotten a great photo. He got amazing photos of Yosemite because he planned them. I got terrible photos because I did not plan them. How dare you speak of Ansel that way? So let's talk about some of the tools you can use to plan your photos. You could use uh, Google Earth. Yeah, that's a helpful Especially for cityscapes, Google Earth, not Google Maps, but Google Earth, will let you see this cityscape in 3D, and then you can adjust the time of day to see exactly how the light is going to hit the buildings, or you can see where the moon is going to rise in the background based on exactly where you're standing, so you can pick your spot. Uh, We also use the photographer's ephemeris, the photographer's ephemeris, which is both a desktop and a mobile app, Um, photo pills, Sun Seeker, those are two mobile apps that I use all the time to figure out where the sun and moon are going to be. Those use augmented reality. So you can hold your phone up and it is look like it, look, it uses the camera. It looks like you're looking right through the phone and it overlays the path 
of the sun and moon. So you can see, okay, from where I'm standing, the sun is going to rise right behind these buildings. Maybe I need to be a quarter mile down if I want to get this picture just perfect. That's how I found out where the moon would be for our lighthouse moonrise picture. That was the first thing I did in planning that photo was yeah. I went and I found out what day the moon would actually rise behind the lighthouse on the water. Yeah, because the, the sun and moon do not rise in the same place. It changes a little bit every day, and depending on where you are on the planet, it might change a whole lot every day. But it doesn't have to be a mystery, and you don't have to just go out every day and see where it comes up. We can plan yeah. these things out. Yeah, we have other people that figured that out for us. You know which app I also use for every outdoor photo shoot? Just my weather app. It's good to know if it's going to rain, what time this sun rises and sets, just simple things. Yeah, I should have mentioned that. I have apps that will show uh, radar overlays of where the clouds are, and I can use that to kind of figure out, okay, is the sunrise going to be really nice today, or is the sun going to be blocked by clouds? I also want to add, as part of planning your photos, like take control of the scene. The number one mistake I see people make is they don't go in and remove distractions from the background. You'll take a picture, it could just be a snapshot of your kid in the house, but you've got uh, a some clothes laying in the corner. Like, go pick up and move those clothes. Like, go 90 percent of doing any kind of on-location photography is just moving things to a different room, and it will improve your photos so much as long as you just take control and do a little bit of thinking ahead of time. Number three, shoot what you love. And this one seems extremely obvious, except I think a lot of the time people end up trying to take photos of what they think everyone else is going to like, and you forget to just take pictures of what actually interests you and what you love. And I think that your passion for what you're shooting shows through. It doesn't have to be something exciting. Sometimes biologists become animal photographers and they end up being some of the best because they understand animal behavior. You don't have to have that in-depth of knowledge, but it could be something like, say you go to car shows every weekend, you clearly love cars, make that a part of your photography. An example is Sally Mann, a very famous photographer, took photos of her own children in her yard, and I think a lot of photographers would think that was boring or too common, except she captured a real slice of life in her part of the world and in her family, and it resonated with people. So don't hesitate to show who you truly are, and don't waste your time trying to take everyone else's pictures when you could be taking your own. You're you. You're unique. You're the only you of you in the world. So document it, learn, and integrate your hobbies with your other hobby, which is photography. Yeah, when I was a kid, the only place I wanted to go was the zoo. That was my favorite place to visit. And as I was a teenager and growing up, I was the only person I knew who cared about the birds or the lizards or the armadillos or whatever wildlife was around. But I was always watching it. I was fascinated by the behaviors and the little differences. And that's why when I got into photography, it was because I was into wildlife photography. But that's not really a lucrative field. It didn't pay a lot, but I still made it work and even made a good living from it because that's what I was passionate about. I could have made more money as a portrait photographer, I, theoretically, except I wasn't that excited about portraits as it was about wildlife. I was going to say, I think you have to be a little bit honest with yourself and I may be speaking from a place of privilege that I get to shoot what I want but I've shot weddings before and I'm not a wedding person I wasn't even excited about my own wedding I'm just not about the formality and I knew I could never really be great at that because I couldn't be passionate about it but like you growing up I only ever wanted to be in nature and I loved animals and when I go out and I take landscape photos that's where I feel good that's where things feel right so take the time to be conscientious of what you love when you're shooting it and focus in on that. We have two more huge tips for you. Huge tips. Including how you can change your photography just by watching TV. Whatever your favorite show is, Game of Thrones, Handmaid's Tale, and how you can your how your photography will benefit from you gaining a little bit of robot vision, learning to see like a computer. Are you just saying that because your default vision is robot vision? <laughs> <laughs> I see like the Terminator. <laughs> but first, let's talk about our sponsor, Squarespace. Whether you need a website, 
a domain, a portfolio, you probably need a portfolio to show off those great photos. You can make a Squarespace website and it's so easy to do. If you can drag and drop, you can make your own. You don't have to be a designer. That doesn't have to be one of your passions to make the best website that you can. You just have to be able to take your photos, drag them onto a Squarespace website, arrange them a little bit, maybe make an about page. We do portfolio reviews and it's yours. Try it out. It's 14 days for free. You don't need to put in a credit card and then remember to cancel. You just make it and if you don't like it, it can go away. And if you do like it, go to squarespace.com slash Chelsea and you can use the coupon code Chelsea to get 10% off of your purchase. And all of that is in the description below. So you can just go on down there and you can click. You can click and you can you can be in love. Thank you, Squarespace. Okay. In love is aggressive. Yeah, maybe I was stretching there. I admit, <laughs> I got a little excited. Okay, so number two, study the greats. And I think this one is becoming more and more important because I found myself just mindlessly ingesting mediocre photography. And sometimes it gets a lot of likes. It's like all that cliche crap we see every day, like people holding hands or like the shot through the heart hands. I mean, what what is that really doing for us? What is there creative or great about that? I mean, in my mind, we should be studying the best of the best and then hoping a little bit of that rubs off on us. Um, my favorite, one, my favorite ever is Gordon Parks. He's amazing. I'm holding up this Gordon Parks book here. It's like a $12 book. And just when you're sitting on the couch, I keep it on the coffee table. I go through and I study his work and I think about what makes him great and what I love about his work, the composition, the storytelling, his ability to tell real stories of conflict and controversial subject matter and put it in a picture. He inspires me. I have Ira Block's book here, uh, Cuba Loves Baseball. It's, he went to Cuba and he documented their baseball culture. Going through and seeing other people's passions, seeing other people's work, especially the greats, if you study it, if you ingest it, if you think about what makes it magnificent and apply all those little pieces of what you like to your own work, you're going to get better in a better way. So, yeah, definitely study the greats. And my related trick is you don't have to learn just from the great stills photographers, though I appreciate them. I really like to learn from movies and TV. Um, not all movies and TV are well filmed and there might not be much you can learn from them, but the best shows, like the greatest single camera shows, things like Game of Thrones was absolutely beautiful. Even if you hate dragons and swords and all that, just check out the visuals. The way they used color and lighting and contrast and subject separation taught me a lot. And I ended up taking a lot of that and putting it into one of the pictures that's now in my portfolio. I saw their light beams and the way they used it to separate the subject from a dark background. Yeah, it's good. And thought about how they made that and ended up recreating it and we happen to have a video on the topic right now i'm learning from the handmaid's tale which is beautifully shot yeah and i think one of my other favorite shows fargo the fargo, tv series was, yeah all the seasons are amazing the first season of true detective and the third season beautifully shot and you can learn so much while just sitting there watching tv so don't tune out and watch tv but tune in and look at every single shot and how it's composed, Tune in. how they use depth of field and lighting, because they're really the masters because they have such high budgets and they take such care for each one of their shots. We've even paused TV shows that we like to talk about the shots. How did they do that? Look at the lighting, look at the contrast, look at the colors, look how they put their head behind the negative space to make them stand out. So. You might annoy your entire family, but you're going to annoy your entire family anyway, so why not do it for a great cause? <laughs> yeah, I'll pause it and take a picture of the screen on my phone, just so I can think about it later. <laughs> that's so creepy, and that's illegal, and I'm telling. <laughs> okay, the number one tip, even though these were in no particular order, <laughs> is see like a camera, which is Tony's robot eyes tip, and also my look with one eye tip. So if you've been taking pictures at all, you've probably realized that things never quite look like how you saw them with your eyeballs. What's with that? You look at a scene, it's beautiful. You take a picture, where did these 500 power lines come from? Did they appear? Did they grow like a tree? No, your brain edits things out and your camera does not. So one of the tips that I like to use for seeing like your camera, using finger air quotes here, 
um, is to close one eye because your two eyes together give you three-dimensional vision. Uh, your camera does not have that. So if you close one eye and you take away your depth perception, you can start to see what the depth will look like in your actual pictures. That might sound silly, except it works really well. So if you're looking at a scene, you put up your hands so that you make this rectangle shape, look through it with one eye, you can see if there's enough subject separation in your scene. And you're also gonna notice the details like power lines and little distractions far better. If you've ever taken a photo and you just thought it was great and you shared it with other people and they kind of, yeah, that's nice. They kind of just shrug it yeah, off. Yeah, like, cool, it's a bird. I think the number one cause of that is when you're taking a photo and you look at it later, you remember so much more than what the photo itself captured. If you're at the beach, you see the water, but you also hear the waves. You feel the wind against your face. Maybe you smell the ocean. And maybe you're you're with loved ones if you're having a good time. You have these feelings, and those all come back to you when you look at the photo. But when other people look at the photo, all they do is get that two-dimensional vision part of it. And that's why people don't always get your photos because your photo, your camera didn't capture everything that you saw and you felt. So learning to isolate that one bit of sense, that two-dimensional vision from everything else that's going on will help you really capture and tell the story that you are feeling. Yeah, Tony, I think that's also a really good point that sometimes we see a scene and we don't realize exactly what's making it beautiful. So you might look at the ocean and you're there with your family and you're having a good time and your kids or your dog is running down the beach and, and you love it and then you just take a picture of the ocean. You're leaving out a huge part of the story. So you can think about all those senses and if you know the people with you that you love are a part of it, put them in your picture. Start making them a part of the story. Or if it's the sound of the waves, get up close, show them crashing, throw the, show the action. So you have to really learn how to incorporate everything that you're feeling into one picture. And if that sounds really hard, that's photography. It's really complicated. And one of the best things about it is you never stop learning. Great suggestion, Celis. I would, in the comments down below, I'd love to hear what other tips people have figured out in their photography experience other than camera, other than camera settings, what higher level methods of thinking have improved your photography in a tangible way? Yeah, let us know. So we'll be back next week with another podcast. You can subscribe in your podcasting app or on YouTube. And thank you Squarespace for making this podcast possible. If you want your very own Squarespace website, a store, a photography portfolio, go to squarespace.com slash Chelsea, and you can use the coupon code Chelsea to get 10% off. Thanks, Squarespace.